ya. Oh, here she comes. <laughs> yes, it's still 100% done, so if you could do what you need to do, then maybe we can bring up the, the main slide. The presentation. Right, I'm going to go and sit in my corner. Okay. Let's have a look. I'm just going to get the desktop, make sure it's there. Let's just see it plays. There was a call showtime. Twenty-five minutes. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> How did you do that? Let's see if we can get the. Yeah. yeah let's just get the, the the sounds. Of space. That's fantastic. Well done. This is yours. Uh, so. It's made me nervous just watching you do that. <laughs> um, where is this, it? It's this there. Way. That's yours. Just so you is know, it? we started it streaming. Okay. Okay, Final Cut was using it. I've just got to get rid of this. Right, let's just get that. That's done. Sounds of safe performance. Showtime, let's get rid of that. And let's get you up. Your mouse needs to be connected. Is it not? Ah, oh, right, okay. Let's see. <laughs> We're streaming. Okay. So, should we go on slide view? Yeah. Slide show there. Play from start. Is that the one? Yeah, that's the one. Cool. Oh, I, re I really don't know whether to wear my glasses or not because no, it's not. really tricky. I, I, I can't see the screen. Good to see, to see people here, isn't it? It's so fantastic. what I'm going to do, when you finish, I'm going to come across and basically say a little introduction that we've worked together for four years yeah. and you've heard, you've heard the talk, now we're going to go into uh, the performance side and then it will go dark and we can come and sit back over here. Okay, so, that's our, what, so, so when I've finished my talk, so at the moment... We wait here, don't we, for B to give the introduction. Yeah, and then, and then I walk he'll call over. you. And Shall we'll I come down? The, I'll go down the middle, I think. Yeah, it's really good, yeah. It's very nice. Yeah. That's so why people, um, yeah, I know I've got this mic on, they always, people tend to come yeah, like right at them. Is he put it upside down? Oh, yeah, it is slightly upside down. Yeah, if you can turn slightly. Yeah, okay. yeah, completely. Yeah, completely. Okay. <laughs> Give me one second. Can we get the bell out? It's actually like upside down. There we are. Now you can have a really good turn. Turn it off. Is it, the time we can't talk is it actually on? <laughs> <laughs> Who's supposed to music speaking? Uh, speaking? Excuse me, Nigel. There was a bell which Jane wants, so I can't see it. I don't know. 
Who do you know? Everybody? I don't like my glasses. Do you think it's better without the glasses? I don't if you need them, you need them. I, I don't. I might like them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's good. It doesn't matter that there's a few spare seats, and then that's fine. I don't, I, think, I don't think you can necessarily judge it to fill every seat. Sorry? I don't think you can necessarily judge it to fill every seat. I don't think it's a seat. I'll go around with. So, is this actually working? Where's Pete? Is it over there? Do you want to go and ask? Is this actually working? Is it coming Sorry? through? Is this coming through? Yeah. yeah? Yes. Clear as a bell. Turn this off when I finish. Do you know how to turn it off now? We can mute it, I think. Exactly. Yeah. So when you finish, as I said, by your finishing off, I'll just come across. Yeah. And then we'll do a little changeover. Yeah. And then, Becky, so I'm going to go across with a tiny spiel, and then I'm, I'm hoping it goes dark. It's not, it's down to there, and then we'll walk across. I was going to come in from I was just thinking it might be worth moving the table back a bit, just because these people here, they're looking through my... Okay. Um, okay. Not, I mean, after... That's a really good idea. Oh, so. You think we should move the table back after the performance so that people over here aren't looking through wires? Yeah. Yes. So if you can help me do that. Before the questions. No, no after, after the talk. After your talk. So if you can come forward with me, we can I'll carry that back carefully. Move it back a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're going, to, we're going to move the computer back a bit before before, before the show because as Becky says, people are looking for. So should you and I do that? We can before, do yeah. as we leave. Yeah. How's that? And Pete then we might. Back. Pete might help as well. Okay, that's great. We're ready. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's so sweaty. Yeah. So in between the pieces, are you just going to pause it for a short time? I'm going to pause it for time, and I'm going to go, and I'm just going to watch you. But in my mind, I'm going one, two, three, four, five. Welcome to all of you who are physically here at British Antarctic Survey's Aurora Innovation Centre and to those of you who are joining us through the live streaming or are watching on demand. I'm Beatrix schlaub Ridley, Director of Innovation here at British Antarctic Survey. It's a great pleasure to introduce today's Sounds of Space performance. This is based on an exciting collaboration that has evolved over the last four years between one of our scientists, Nigel Meredith, who will give a presentation shortly, and an artist engineer, Diana Scarborough, both located here in Cambridge. They have drawn in a dancer, Becky Byers from London, and the composer Kim Cunio, who has come over all the way from Australia to intensify the collaboration 
We are really privileged to have you with us, Kim, and also your son, Samurai, who will be part of the performance later on as well, uh, playing percussion. Together, they will give us a festival for our senses in the performance we are about to see. At British Antarctic Survey, we are keen to support such collaborations between our own scientists and a wide range of artists. We value this as an important tool to challenge ourselves to think differently beyond the borders of our own disciplines and to unlock a new level of creativity that enriches the work of all those who are involved. As scientists and engineers who care deeply about the natural environment um, which we research, we also value the potential of the outputs from such collaborations to communicate the significance of the scientific work we do, particularly to audiences who might not find numbers and graphs quite as enticing as we do. I trust that you will enjoy today's event and will celebrate with us the beauty and the wonder of this data-driven, multidisciplinary journey from Halley in Antarctica to beyond the galaxy. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and, and uh, to reiterate B's words, uh, a welcome to our show, which is entitled uh, Sounds of Space. Uh, and just by way of, of an outline, it will start with a, a, a short scientific presentation from myself to introduce to you some of the sounds which you will then be able to recognise, hopefully, in the performance. My talk will be followed by the performance itself, which will contain animation, dance, music and soundscapes. And then at the end, we will hopefully have 10 minutes or so uh, for a question and answer session. Now, by way of an introduction, our planet produces uh, a wonderful variety of radio emissions. And these uh, radio waves are generated by two principal processes. One is from uh, lightning activity in thunderstorms, and the second is via geomagnetic storms driven by the sun. Now, these uh, radio transmissions are at the lower end of the frequency at the radio spectrum, between 100 hertz and 10 kilohertz. And they can be best detected uh, by large antennae, either in space or at remo remote locations on the ground. Now, the radio spectrum covers a, a broad range of frequencies uh, below 300 gigahertz and is used for a, a variety of applications from satellite communications through TV, AM radio, and at the very lowest uh, frequencies for communication with submarines. And Earth's natural radio is in the ELF-VLF range, right at the, the, the lowest end of this spectrum. Now, it turns out that the, the frequency response of the human ear uh, also extends from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, essentially in the ELF-VLF range. Exactly uh, the same range that the Earth's naturally uh, occurring signals um, occur in. Now, as we know, we can't hear things in space, since sound waves are vibrations typically of air molecules, but the emissions uh, we're talking about today are mainly uh, electromagnetic waves, and they cannot be heard directly. However, we can uh, turn these recorded uh, emissions into uh, waveform audio files, which we can then play back and listen to as sound. And this is what enables us to hear the sounds of space. Interestingly, the emissions can also be detected um, using a simple radio receiver and converted to sound waves using an audio amplifier. And these devices can be bought online for the order of £100 or so and allow anyone to go outside and try and listen to some of these sounds of space uh, for themselves. Now, I'd just like to introduce the spectrum analyzer, which is an important tool for us because this uh, enables us to visualize the audio signals by plotting uh, the amplitude or the intensity of the sound uh, on a frequency versus time graph. Now, I'd like to start by um, 
listening, letting you listen to some sounds that uh, are recorded uh, from the surface of the planet. And for this, we're, we're choosing to listen to some, um, of some of the sounds from Halley, which turns out to be a, a great location to record the sounds of space because it's magnetically connected um, to the outer radiation belt where a large proportion of the ELF, VLF signals are generated. And it's also electromagnetically quiet as it lies far from man-made sources which can interfere with the signals. Now, we use the data uh, primarily to uh, investigate the science of space weather storms and also to understand the uh, impacts of space weather on the Earth climate system and also for lightning detection as part of a worldwide lightning detection network. But we can also convert these uh, directly to sound to reveal the uh, mesmerizing and fascinating uh, sounds of space. So now I'm going to take you through uh, some of the sounds. If you're on the ground with a VLF receiver, the main thing that you will receive uh, are signals from lightning activity. And each uh, lightning flash emits a short uh, radio pulse uh, known as a spheric, which covers a wide range of frequencies. And these are heard as short cracks and appear as vertical lines in a spectrogram. And the spherics can be detected from lightning activity that is up to 10,000 kilometers away. So that's lightning activity heard uh, in, in the Antarctic and the, the signals that we um, typically hear are from either the Congo Basin or from, from the Amazon itself. Now spherics can, eat, can travel even further, up to half away around the globe. And the higher frequencies travel slightly faster than the lower frequencies so that these signals undergo dispersion. And these signals now are known as tweaks and have a pronounced ringing nature. Now, some of the radio waves associated with the lightning can leave the atmosphere and leak into space and be guided by the Earth's magnetic field and received in the opposite hemisphere. They can even be reflected from the opposite hemisphere and be detected in the same hemisphere as the original lightning strike. Again, the higher frequencies travel faster than the lower frequencies, and now because they've traveled further, um, the waves we, we, we record once they've been out into space have a characteristic descending tone and they're known as whistlers. So they're fairly faint, but I hope you can hear them. Now, unlike whistlers, chorus emissions are generated deep within the Earth's magnetosphere itself. Briefly, energetic electrons enter the magnetosphere during geomagnetic storms driven by the sun, and this causes the Earth's beautiful aurora, and at the same time, generates chorus emissions. And the most common form consists of rising and falling tones in the frequency range from 1 to 5 kilohertz. And these emissions are known as chorus because they can resemble the twittering of birds in the dawn chorus. Plasmospheric hiss is another important uh, magnetos magnetospheric emission, and unlike chorus, uh, this emission is a broadband structureless signal that resembles audible hiss. So 
would now like to take us away from the surface of the Earth and up into near-Earth space, where, where the signals are travelling along the magnetic field lines and can be, generate, can be detected uh, in situ uh, by satellites orbiting the Earth. Now this spectrogram shows a brief series of whistlers uh, below 6 kilohertz, and these uh, signals were detected by the emphasis instrument on the Van Allen probe A back in 2015. Now, chorus can also be uh, detected uh, in situ in space, and this uh, spectrogram shows chorus emissions as a population of short, very intense rising tones below 1 kilohertz. And these emissions were recorded by the emphasis instrument on Van Allen Probe B back in 2012. <laughs> Now, chorus emissions, as I've mentioned, are enhanced during geomagnetic storms driven by the sun. And we find from statistical studies that these waves are strongest on the dawn side from about four to nine Earth radii from the planet, as can be seen from this, this survey, which was uh, compiled uh, using data from seven satellites. Now, these waves, it turns out, can accelerate electrons to very high energies. And studying these uh, effects is important since uh, these so-called killer electrons can damage satellites. And here at BASS, we use global maps such as these in computer models to produce space weather forecasts. We're now going to move away from the Earth and, look at, and listen to some sounds uh, from other planets in our solar system because it turns out that natural radio is also produced on these planets. For example, Corus has been uh, detected on each of the gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. I'd like to start with this uh, spectrogram, which shows um, the NASA Juno spacecraft, um, the signals that it uh, received as it approached Jupiter back in 2016. And these emissions were recorded at a distance of about 9 million kilometers from the planet. And this, what I'm going to play to you now, is the Jovian bow shock, where the particles streaming from the sun first encountered the planet's massive magnetic field. Now, interestingly, Jupiter also has lightning storms, which can generate whistlers, just like at Earth. And this spectrogram shows um, two whistlers um, at Jupiter, which were recorded by Voyager 1 in 1979. Chorus is also generated in Jupiter's radiation belts, and this spectrogram shows Chorus at Jupiter, again recorded by Voyager 1, on the same day as, as the Whistlers, actually. Oops. Now, most electromagnetic emissions are not in the audio frequency range. However, they can be converted to audio signals by scaling the observed frequencies such that they fall into the audio range. Now, energetic electrons uh, are emitted uh, by solar flares, which are massive explosions on the surface of the sun. And these electrons uh, produce oscillations at a characteristic frequency known as the electron plasma frequency. And the frequency of these emissions decreases rapidly uh, as you move away from the sun. Now, this spectrogram uh, shows a type 3 uh, radio burst uh, produced by an intense solar flare back in 2003. And this observation was made by the Cassini spacecraft at a distance of about 8.7 astronomical units from the sun. And in order to 
hear these sounds, the uh, Cassini scientists have shifted the frequency downwards by a factor of a thousand and also uh, compressed the signal so that four hours is played back in 15 seconds. Now we're going to move from hearing the sun to, to the sound of a comet. Uh, the satellite Rosetta detected uh, magnetic fluctuations uh, from comet kuriumov gerasimenko And these uh, variations occurred at a frequency of 40 to 50 millihertz, which is well below the audio range. And these were first detected when the spacecraft was about 100 kilometers uh, from the comet. And in order to hear these, uh, the Rosetta scientists have, sh have shifted uh, the frequency upwards uh, by a factor of about 10,000. Now Saturn is also a source of intense radio emissions and this spectrogram was recorded by Cassini back in 2003 and in order, in order to hear these the Cassini scientists shifted the frequency downwards by a factor of 44 and also compressed the sound so that 27 minutes is played back in 73 seconds. I'll just play you a short clip for, for, from this sound now, it's one of my favourite ones. So now we're going to move away uh, from the solar system and listen to some, some sounds, some galactic sounds um, from pulsars. Now pulsars are uh, highly magnetized neutron stars with masses uh, greater than the sun uh, but a radius of only 10 to 15 kilometers and this means that if you had a, th a thimble full of neutron star it would weigh about 100 million tons so they're very compressed objects and radiation is beamed out along the magnetic poles as they rotate and the pulses of radiation are received as the beam crosses the Earth. And this is a recording of the, the brightest pulsar in the northern sky from the Lovell Telescope at Jodrell Bank. And the, period, the rotational period of this uh, neutron star is 0.71 seconds. Now different pulsars um, spin at different rates and this is a recording of the Vila pulsar from the Parkes radio telescope in Australia and this pulsar rotates at 11 times per second. So there are over 2,000 known pulsars and you can almost choose your pulsar to select the beat that you want. Some pulsars actually spin a lot faster and this is a recording of the brightest so-called millisecond pulsar also recorded by the Parkes radio telescope and this one rotates about 170 times a second and millisecond pulsars are thought to be old rapidly rotating neutron stars which have been spun up by attracting matter from a companion star in a close binary system and I won't play this for too long because it's a bit painful. Depends how much I like the audience, how long I leave that one playing for. <laughs> now we're going to move away from the galaxy and just listen to uh, a couple of uh, galactic sounds that have only just recently actually become available. If, if I'd been given this talk five years ago, I wouldn't be able to present these sounds. And these are from gravitational waves as opposed to electromagnetic waves. Now these waves were first predicted by Einstein back in 1916 and they were finally observed nearly a hundred years later uh, on the 14th of September 2015 by the LIGO interferometers in America. And this was the first ever detection of gravitational waves which are ripples in space-time produced by violent events. And this chirp, which doesn't last very long, 
comes from the merger of two black holes that took place 1.3 billion years ago. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Happened so fast, I'll, I'll play it again. And interestingly, these waves are actually in the ELF VLF range, so there hasn't been any tweaking. They're actually natural sounds, if you like. And only just last year, LIG LIGO made uh, the detection of gravitational waves from two colliding neutron stars that took place 130 million years ago. And this was the first ever cosmic uh, event that was observed in both gravitational waves and light. And interestingly, the light-based observations showed that heavy elements such as platinum and gold were produced by the collision. And this helped solve the uh, age-old question of where these elements are actually made. So there's your gold. <laughs> go, go and do a bit of mining. <laughs> so I'd just like to finish by coming back to Earth and uh, play some sounds from, the, uh, from, from, from an, an ancient uh, ice core from, collected from the Antarctic because it also sounds uh, relatively space-like. And this particular sample is about 200,000 years old. And what we hear now are the noises coming from the ice as the captured and highly compressed uh, atmosphere of the past cracks and fizzes out. Okay, thank you very much. And we can now go on to the performance part of the show, which I hope you're all going to enjoy as much as I know I will. his research and his data, and listening to data as audio rather than the graphs, for me it was transformative. That these sounds had emotion, they had a sense of time, mysterious. Who knows what space really sounds like? And so uh, this has been a start of a journey that has gone from purely animations and working with Nigel to adding some music um, by Kim Cuneo, and also working with a dancer. Um, so to show that the performance that you are going to hear and see, I'd like you to take time sometimes to close your eyes, not too long, because actually we don't know what sound, uh, sound is really. But I think my role of an artist, that I can add emotional nuances, I can put questions there, I can make it bigger and more engaging. So I'm going to take you on a journey with the data from Earth out to an extra galactic place. And uh, we're going to do that through a series of pure sounds, a mixture of animation and sounds. We've got dance, we've got everything, the whole mix. So I don't know which one you prefer. There's a lot of background there, but I'm going to invite everybody on now and um, take you on a journey. I hope I should disappear. I'm here to press the buttons. Okay, so I, I am not part of the performance, I'd like to know. Um, I'm here as...
Make it difficult. <laughs> oh, sorry. Hello there. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much. I wondered if you could just say a little bit about how, how, uh, di when did you maybe all first meet, and how how did that. How much would you do kind of separately and how much together and you know or tell talk about some of the those different interactions between you from any of okay, I think there's a bit of a time limit, so i I do talk too much, so I'll try and keep it um, simple. Um, it all started four years ago uh, i there was a an art science be dating event in a way where 20 scientists get to meet 20 artists and somehow we get to choose. And I don't know who choose, chose me or I chose Nigel, but um, looking at his data, I'm an artist engineer, so I do like data. And then we spent some time together exploring the idea of, vi of, of hearing data and I did some animations. That's our first iteration. We um, did a gig uh, this year in March and as a result of the space we were in we felt it needed more and I've worked with Becky before um, she's very bravely does many interesting things with me she's become a machine and she's done some quantum tunneling or qu quantum things and so she was quite up for becoming um, part of our space journey uh, as an animator and filmmaker is sound led and that's where Kim came in um, in that first iteration Kim provided a lot of soundtracks which he very nicely asked me I was allowed to mash them up and use them with the sounds of space and now we have him in person it's a bit of a long haul but anyway it's been an evolution is probably the quick response anyone else want to say anything Actually, I do need to say a thank you to one of our colleagues, Rob Larter, who originally made the introduction to Diana in uh, late 2014. I went back through the emails and, uh, and look what has developed since then. It's a, it's a real pleasure. Any other questions? Okay, and then the other one. Yeah, if you go first. I think they need the microphone. Those visual images, you know, can you t tell us something about the source material? Um, thank you. Uh, source material. Um, one, uh, some of them, the Earth Night Day, is actually from Halley. Um, it's actually, um, yeah, a lot of the animations are made from stills that are blended with other things. I can give you the secret. So some of them are from Halley. The beautiful one from the Aurora is actually also from Halley. Um, there's some mixes in there that are not from Halley. I don't want to give all my secrets away, but one of them was about snow. We had some snow beginning of uh, this year, so there's some of that in there. Um, there's also someone in the audience, um, a professor, that has actually uh, given me some footage uh, from uh, experiments in dark matter. They're actually generated by data and She's allowed me to use some of them. So if you want to meet her um, over there, that's Leniana. Leniana, hello. Um, so really, it's blended and a whole lot of tricks with Final Cut. 
And there was a question over here. Um, what's the triangle stringed instrument you're playing? It's really beautiful. Uh, that's a copy of a copy of a 9th to 11th century instrument called a psaltery, P-S-A-L-T-E-R-Y, which means psalms in Latin. And we think that was an instrument that women primarily used to learn how to chant the psalms. And the most famous woman who probably played it was Hildegard of Bingen, 1098 to 1179, the Sibyl of the Rhine. And uh, so I first got involved with that instrument about 15 years ago. I started actually arranging the music of Hildegard, and so I started playing a lot of early music instruments, uh, hurdy-gurdies and things like that. And so for me, what really appealed was, of course, just the quality of everyone here, but then also being able to think, well, because this stuff is old, we should go back in time to look at older instruments as well as looking at, you know, sort of what new technology can do. So, so that's that instrument. I actually normally bring a lot more... Um, early instruments with me but I had an accident on the plane I'm sorry to say some things broke so it was one of those things any other questions um, hello it's, it was just an observation that um, the, the sound pulsars from the, the Saturn sound sounded very like Doctor Who uh, music <laughs> and there's always this I think it's Henry Moore who talks about art and science and which came first and science as a trajectory of inevitable discovery well art um, is out of the imagination and I just wonder if you had any thoughts of where does that sort of um, we've all got the sort of 60s soundscape of the science of, of space and yet the reality is actually rather close to it I just wondered if there's something which came first. And then I suppose I had a second question that the music was so poetic. I just wondered whether were, were those real um, rhythms in of the of the of the um, uh, scientific space sounds in underpinning the music or was it all just from another source? Yeah, I think I think there are some some natural rhythms to the to the space sounds. Obviously, you've got the the the, the, the beats of the, the pulsars themselves, but then you've got um, you've got the sounds of the chorus, and and that can be very very rhythmic, uh, some of the time, and uh, and then at other times you've just got kind of these kind of pure sounds that kind of rise and fall. So that there's all kinds of of different sounds that that we get for for, for from space. Yeah, in, in answer to what you said, I felt the same thing when I first, actually it was about five years ago I first, you know, surfed some NASA sites and started listening to this. I was doing a, a sort of a, a completely different project with someone's brain waves and, but, and so I was just thinking about, you know, all these ways that music can, can sort of, you know, work with these sort of, you know, other data sets. And, and I thought the same thing. I thought this is the BBC Radiophonic Lab or Return to the Forbidden Planet. And then I realised that maybe we're smarter than we think as a species in terms of how we, how we imagine things. Because if we think about it, the early electroacoustics, uh, starting with people like Pierre Schaeffer, they were really thinking about how electronics and how radio signals could actually be the basis of composition. So there was this huge revolution from really about the late 40s to the 70s, probably ending with Stockhausen, where basically people said that the things that were music are no better than sound that we've privileged this sort of like orderly notion of music, particularly this notion of, you know, equal temperament and scales over all these naturally occurring things. And I think what World War II did to us as a, as a group of people was we imagined greater dissonance because of the horrors of that war, and that enabled us to imagine the sounds of science fiction. So it's this combination of, you know, this huge change in technology, the, the same technology that enabled all our science to happen, just completely revolutionised music. And what I think is great about now is that all this stuff that was hardware, we can software drive as well. So stuff that was, you know, would take, you know, essentially a couple of buildings to do 40 years ago is sitting in a laptop. It may not be quite the same, but there's this really great evolution. Now, quickly about this rhythm about sound. Of course, as we probably all know, uh, all pitch is oscillation, isn't it? So if we say A equals 440, that's 440 oscillations per second. And the octave is uh, 880 or 220. So basically all pitch is rhythm, which is one of the nicest thoughts for us because I think some people feel they have a rhythmic weakness. But then when we realise every time we actually make something that has a pitch and even speech is a pitch, we're actually doing rhythm. And of course all things 
naturally get ordered by the human brain to become a little bit more rhythmic than they really are. That's just a way that we call it entrainment in music. So we sort of interpret music by doing this really interesting thing. So we construct patternistic phrases, even if we only hear something once or twice. And so that would be uh, how I'd explain that. There are rhythms in this, and I had a bit of fun notating a few ideas, and one of the spin-offs we're going to do is I'm going to start notating these sounds of space exactly, which I think would be really interesting. You know, isn't it amazing to think that we just have that, you know, the first uh, proof of, you know, gravitational waves is just three notes. Da, dum, bum, uh, G sharp, A and D. Three notes, which is coincidentally the same notes as the start of The Simpsons. How cool is that? <laughs> Is your dance the same every time you do this performance, or do you change it every time? So, a lot of it is different each time. Um, some of it's more set. I have sort of in my in my head, I have an emotion and a feeling of for each sort of sound. So I think because the rawness of them like really invokes a sound, like a feeling in me. Um, so that's kind of what I've got in my head. Um, and that's kind of how I explore the movement and create new things each time. But some of it is set. A bit of both. <laughs> I'm just, just interested in some of the practicalities of performance. The, the live instrumental parts, I'm wondering to what extent those were notated and improvised. Um, and also you're interested in how you achieve synchronization with the pre-recorded material, the video, and presumably pre-recorded sound. There's, there's an interesting tradition. Uh, we used to call it live music to tape, and it sort of started in, it started really primarily in a place called Ircam in Paris, which is you know this sort of amazing lab where people started getting this idea that you could actually pre-record little things and then and score stuff to them, and so that. You know, it's really a way in which we train composers now. It's one of, maybe not the core skill, which is still probably writing for symphonic instruments, but after that it's probably skill number two, is to be able to do these sorts of things. And this has been a major change. So because I have to teach it, I have to do it as well. So it took me a while to get reasonably good at it. And uh, I started off by notating everything, being really, really rigid, because it's just much easier that way to, to follow something. And slowly over the last decade with these sorts of projects, I've been able to relax it. Now what I do is I write just four or five bars of something and I spend time improvising. So I've been staying with Diana and so the evenings of, you know, Diana's been just listening to me. Just get these, get these figures from the pre-recorded material, which, you know, took, of course, hours to, to put together. Diana did some incredible work and then I came in and, and did some more at the end of that. And then it was sort of like finding a way for the fingers to follow it. I think there's this interesting skill that musicians have to do now. You know, we used to get trained to be either sort of classical players or jazz players. So you either improvised or you didn't. And nowadays we have to be both. And I think it's really fun to sort of heal this divide. It's a little version of the art-science divide as well that, you know, we have to be able to think left and right brain. So that, that's how it's done, really through rehearsal. And I guess you could say uh, trust. It's also when things don't have a particular tonality making the tonality come. So there's as an aspect of really active composition in saying like the second piece, for example, didn't really have a tonality. So I started off by playing in, in a tone row derived from the work of Schoenberg. And then I was able to slowly then bring it into something that was tonal. So these are just experiments, the same way Diana's doing with the images and Becky's doing with, with the dance. We just feel it. What a lovely question. It's an extraordinary thought to think of these things coming from an epicenter of an event that happened millions of years ago, and then those waves just traveling across the universe and the tiniest fraction interacting with the instruments that you've got out there. And I kind of think, well, actually, there's another epicenter here of this performance. I've never heard anything like it in this location, and maybe that those waves will travel out into our research. But there is a question that I'm getting to, which is for Nigel. What's out there that we haven't heard that would actually make us stop and gasp? Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that uh, that's a that's a great question, and um, one that I think I'm starting to sort of find the answer to because in, in, in working with, with with the collaboration here, it's 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 kind of made me go back and start to listen in more detail to the recordings from Halley. Um, to start off with, um, I kind of did this as an outreach activity, and I went to try and find as many and varied sounds a as I could. Um, but more recently. Uh, and working with, with Frontier Developments as well, um, I've been looking specifically at the sounds from Halley, and they're amazingly rich. And we have, like, just, I think, from 2012 to 2017, we have a, a one-minute recording every 15 seconds. Uh, sorry, every 15 minutes. And I was speaking to Mark yesterday, and he, he told us um, we also have uh, recordings now which are continuous, I think, for a, for a period of a year and a half. And then as you go back into the archive, there's stuff on DAT tapes and reel-to-reel -reel going back to 1971. So there's a lot of data there and a lot of very interesting signals. And I, I was fascinated the other day because I was, I was trying to apply some science to it. So I was looking at when we know the signals are going to be strongest. Let's, let's go and listen and let's see what we hear. And I thought, well, I'll start off with a, a really quiet day when I should hear nothing. So let's just calibrate nothing. And I went to a really quiet day and I found some of the most amazing sounds. Rather than the whoop, whoop, whoop that, that you get from the chorus when it's really active, I was just getting these, these really nice, long-lasting whistling sounds. So who knows, actually, what's in the data set? I mean, this isn't kind of my job to, to analyze the Halley data. So I'm just, I use it, basically I use the spectrograms and I spend a little bit of time listening to them, but it, you know, we have years worth of recording, so you'd, you'd need to automate something to go and look for unusual signatures. But I think there's a lot of interesting stuff out there and I'm kind of sharing it with Kim and we're gonna explore that together over the, over the next year or so. Yeah, we yeah, I was just listening to again during this really quiet day. There's some, there was some hiss, which I played you earlier, which was just fairly constant. But I also found this day where that the hiss was actually pulsing at about a, a repetition rate of about every four seconds, and it just sounded like a, a kind of a monster breathing in the background. <laughs> We're being watched. I wonder whether there may be a collaboration with Alan in there if you, yeah. if you want to look at automation of finding some of these things. Um, maybe we can have a conversation later on. Any other questions? I think this is a, a great collaboration and it's good to see sort of everyone contributing in equal measures. I think that's really important. Um, I suppose two questions. Um, one is sort of... Um, what's next in terms of the development? How are you going to progress this further? Uh, all of you. Um, and I suppose the one that follows that is when are we going to see this in a arts organization? Well, who wants to start? <laughs> Thank you for the easy question. <laughs> um, we are hoping that the next rendition, which will not well, it might be different, is at the Blue Dot Festival uh, in July of next year. It's an, I think Bass, oh you can tell me, perhaps Jane, Bass is a regular contributor to the Blue Dot Festival, which is at Jodrell Bank, so lovely to see that we've got some Pulsar data from Jodrell Bank anyway. Um, we would like to sort of see it where we get the dance and we get the animations and we get the talk and not sure if that's possible. Obviously, from my point of view, that is fantastic. I think the whole idea of bringing this fusion of art and science and beauty and curiosity engagement to um, 5,000 people a day rather than you know, 110, it's what it's all about. Um, so that's great. That's kind of what's next. Um, Kim, and having Kim come to stay um, because of his idea, he's talking about a, possibly a Sounds of Space record uh, as a label that's something that we'll be discussing. I think that's as far as we've got. Anyone want to add something to that? Uh, yes, yeah, so an interesting thing happened last year in, in my university. Someone very high up said, I think we need a new academic record label. So I've been spending the last year planning what an open source uh, scholastic record label would look like because, of course, you know, fine music is dying around us, as we probably know due to, you know, so many things, streaming, the end of royalties, all these things are sort of ending music as we've known it since, you know, the end of World War II. 
And so we're thinking about all all the focus areas, and one of them is uh, that we've got is acoustic ecology. So we're actually looking to to think well. What's the acoustic ecology of this planet and how might that actually intersect in sort of mainstream listening? How can we do that? So, for example, our first project in that is um, looking at uh, proposed mine sites in, in really beautiful areas and actually logging the acoustic ecology before and after mining to see, you know, so we can actually see, you know, the acoustic differences of these spaces, which I think is very interesting because, as Nigel said, we can run these spectrograms on them and so we can actually see them and we can animate, you know, a visual representative of you know, of this acoustic phenomenon. And so I spent a wonderful day with Nigel and meeting a few colleagues from, from Bass yesterday and uh, I got really excited about the idea that we might actually sign uh, Halley to the label and, uh, and have Halley release A Day in the Life of Halley next year. Wouldn't that be cool? So, so because, because of this sort of nature, we can actually stitch back together the time-lapse audio and have a day in the life and then from there we can actually commission a really interesting bunch of musicians or people or artists of any sort to actually work with that as sort of like an interactive ar album. So that's certainly what the part I want to take back quickly to um, to Australia and you know get the go-ahead for that and I think there's there's lots more. I mean I think Dinah's leading a very interesting notion of bringing three artists in to work with Nigel and I think it's going to grow immensely. Uh, I'm very hopeful about the arts organisation bit. I think in terms of my university, the VC is a complete music lover and he's a Nobel Prize winner. So at the moment there's a window for me to make these things happen. So I'm going to try and run with it. And I, and I think it's really interesting when these things are not just in arts organisations but in science organisations. I think to me it's even more interesting. So I think that's where we re really need to do it as well. That's a very interesting link also to one um, other collaboration we have established between one of our ecosystem scientists and, um, and, and another um, artist who, who is sound motivated about um, marine acoustic pollution. Um, so that might be an additional um, strand to feed into that label uh, when you've got it up and running. Um, I think we could continue here for hours. The trouble is um, we've advertised from two to three, so some people have to have to move on. Uh, we have, however, our beautiful icebreaker just round the corner. Um, those of you who would like to stay and continue the discussion, please feel free to, to move over there and uh, find refreshments and, um, and good company and good conversation. Um, I would like to hand over to our di director, Professor Dame Jane Francis, for uh, final words of thank you. Thank you, Beatrix, and thank you all for coming. But wow, I mean, what, what an afternoon. I mean, this, this room has never seen anything like this, and it really ha I, I feel like I've been in space <laughs> all afternoon, so it's been absolutely amazing. And thanks to Beatrix, too, because Beatrix set this up to have an art-science collaboration and the whole point of it is it's not just about people going to Antarctica and painting pictures. It's actually the interaction of artists with scientists to communicate science in a very different way. Boy, have you done that. So that, that's just amazing. So if there are any, of, any artists or any budding artists in the audience who would like to team up with one of our science projects, we have scientists who've got projects waiting for you. So please see Beatrix and we've got more adventures to go on. So thank you so much. That was absolutely fantastic. I think I must go to Blue Dot because it will be sensational <laughs> to see it at Jodrell Bank. And thanks to all of you for coming. If you have any more questions, please do hang around, have a cup of tea and, and, and uh, talk to these amazing guys. Thank you very much. And thanks to Beatrix. Can we, well? we say thank you to Pete? Oh. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> thanks to Pete. <laughs> Come on, Pete. Okay, I think we've just got a new member of our team. Uh, I, we couldn't have done this without him. This is actually a lecture theatre, and the job was to transform it into a performance space. He's also secretly an artist. I know that, but anyway, I just want to say we couldn't have done it without him. So um, I hope you survived. Anything you want to say? No, it's been absolutely fantastic. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Okay, well, thank, thank you very much.